Okay, our next speaker is Colin Walmsley. And I met Colin actually a few years ago at the Western Trade Show. And he has really helped the program quite a bit by providing slides of, uh, you know, field pest situations um, and even PowerPoints. So anyway, Colin has been with the Missouri Department of Agriculture's Plant Pest Control Bureau since 2000. He's serving as a state entomologist and bureau manager since 2007. He is a Missouri native, having grown up on a sixth generation Missouri farm in the Mississippi River Hills of Pike County. Colin studied at North Northwest Missouri State University and Kansas State University. He earned degrees in, um, sorry, earning degrees in agronomy and agriculture, agricultural entomology. The Office of the State Entomologist for the Missouri Department of Agriculture was established in 1868 and is responsible for preventing the introduction and spread of exotic plant pests into Missouri. And uh, so Colin Wamsley is going to talk about uh, invasive pest. Welcome, Colin. If you don't mind, I think I'm going to come down on the floor here and this is going to be kind of more of a, I guess, a practical nuts and bolts talk about uh, a few of the, the invasive pests that we're dealing with right now um, and that certainly affect the nursery industry. Um, but just to start out, uh, the, the Plant Pest Control Bureau at the Missouri Department of Ag, um, we work with the nursery industry um, as, a, as a regulatory function. Uh, we inspect all of our nursery growers once a year and look for insect and disease pests and provide control recommendations. We also do uh, export certifications for plant-based commodities that are being shipped out of the country. Uh, and we certify those based on the receiving country's requirements. And then we also do a lot of uh, invasive pest survey work uh, in cooperation with uh, USDA Plant Protection and Quarantine and uh, the US Forest Service and other agencies. Um, so we also do, do a lot of uh, a survey work. Um, so today I just wanted to talk about uh, thousand cankers disease of walnut. It's a, a new pest complex that you might start hearing about. Um, very devastating uh, pest complex to a very valuable uh, forest resource uh, for Missouri and Kansas and other Midwestern states. Going to spend more time on that, but also talk quickly about emerald ash borer and, and the response to that that's going on in Missouri. We did find emerald ash borer in Missouri back in 2008. And then I'll also talk about uh, the gypsy moth, which um, has been in the United States since the late 1800s. And we've been surveying for it in Missouri for the last 43 years. Um, but it's getting very close to our state, and uh, it has a, a really great pest potential um, for some very valuable forest resources for Missouri. So it's something that's uh, very high up on our priority list. Um, but just to start out with, And I need to click through this, or? Is it on? Oh, maybe it's not on. All right. All right, that works a lot better when the remote is on. Um, so there's been a, a trend over the last 100 years of, um, of introduction of, of invasive pests that affect you know, not only our forests, but our agricultural field crops and, and a lot of our plant resources. But here over probably the last 20 years, there's just been this incredible influx of uh, forest pests. You've heard of Asian longhorn beetle, sudden oak death, emerald ash borer, um, uh, and Cyrex wood wasp is a newer one that affects pines. Um, so there's been this incredible introduction of, of forest pests. And um, for the nursery industry, um, it really catches you all in the middle um, because these forest pests come in, into the country and they get established in a certain part of the country. Uh, and then there are quarantines that are, that are established that restrict the movement of nursery stock. And for the nurseries that are caught up in those areas, um, it, it has a tremendous impact. For nurseries here that, that uh, have produced a lot of ash over the last several years, uh, you're certainly aware of the impact that the emerald ash borer has had on your business. Um, even before quarantines were put in place um, in Missouri or, or other states, just the market demand for, for ash um, plummeted. And a lot of nurseries I know in Missouri had a significant part of their inventory uh, planted in ash. And so that very immediately uh, hurt their businesses. Um, so there's this, this ongoing trend of, of uh, introduction of uh, invasive plant pests into the, into the United States. And there are a lot of causes for this. Um, probably one of the most significant causes is um, solid wood packing material. And so all of our 
our goods that are shipped into the country, whether it's DVD players or uh, hockey sticks or whatever it is, come into the United States in these 20 or 40 foot metal shipping containers. And in that container with the commodity is wood packing material that it's either the pallet or it's um, wood dunnage that help, helps keep the, the commodity in place. And if that wood product, if that dunnage wasn't treated properly, it might still have a live wood pest inside of it. And so when that container is opened up in the United States, um, that pest will go ahead and complete its life cycle and, and come out and infest the, the forests in that area where the container was opened. Um, so for fiscal year 09, the Customs and Border Protection uh, Agency tells us that over 50, 57,000 of these shipping containers enter the United States each day which uh, is over 21 million shipping containers per year. And I'm told that somewhere around 2% of those containers are opened up and inspected for, uh, for wood boring pests and other, other pests. Um, and then we're also having more and more interior ports um, being opened up. Um, so these pests aren't getting established at Miami or Oakland, but they might be established in Kansas City or St. Louis or where some of these other interior ports are being considered uh, uh, for opening. And then nursery stock, it's, it's, not a, it's not a pathway of introduction into the United States necessarily, but it's a, a pathway for movement around the United States. So again, I mean, you all are getting caught in the middle of, of these invasive forest pests that are being shipped into the country. And then firewood, you'll, you'll hear people talking more and more about firewood as a pathway for forest pests. Um, if you're in the Detroit, Michigan area, you know, 10 years ago and your ash trees were dying, ash is a really good firewood species. So you cut the tree down and you chop it up into firewood and you take it with you camping uh, when you go down to uh, Wapapello Lake in, in southeast Missouri and, and now Missouri has emerald ash borer. And that's a, a mode of movement for a lot of these forest pests. Um, and then here over the last few years, of course, with an economic downturn, um, you know, state and federal regulatory budgets to deal with these pests are dwindling. And, um, you know, USDA in particular has more and more uh, invasive pest programs now that they have to, to deal with with a, with a flat budget. Um, so the response, uh, either from state or federal agencies, um, isn't necessarily always as, as robust as it should be um, in an economic downturn. So just to give you an idea, just in Missouri, um, these are surveys that have been done over the last decade in Missouri um, when it's been reported that possibly one of these pests was introduced in, into the state. Uh, sudden oak death, we've been doing traceback surveys for that over the last uh, probably six or seven years uh, when it was thought that nursery stock from the west coast uh, uh, might have brought sudden oak death into the state. Um, light brown off, apple moth, we've done surveys for that. Asian longhorn beetle, emerald ash borer. Uh, for those of you that produce geraniums, um, you may have heard of Ralstonia, uh, which is a bacterial disease that was uh, introduced in the United States a few years ago. And we had, I think we had six greenhouses in Missouri that came up positive for that. And it was eradicated, but um, it, it cost greenhouse growers a lot of money. Uh, pink hibiscus mealybug, plum pox virus, and gypsy moth. These are just several pests that we've deal, uh, dealt with and, and that have um, had a risk of being introduced into the state. And the three that are highlighted in yellow there, those are three that uh, we actually have detected at some point. So I wanted to talk about thousand cankers disease. Um, and this is something that's, that's fairly new. Uh, black walnuts um, were noticed to be dying out in some of the western states, uh, Colorado, and so forth, and um, a couple of scientists at Colorado State University finally was able to discover or determine what, what was causing mortality in black walnuts, and they found out it was a tiny little beetle called the walnut twig beetle, and uh, a fungus called Geosmithia morbida, which the fungus is, is brand new to science. Um, it's actually in the process of being named right now, um, officially. Um, so the, the beetle itself, the tiny little walnut twig beetle, carries this fungus on, on its surface, the fungal spores. And so when it uh, goes into the tree, it introduces the fungus. And every place a beetle goes into the tree, a, a new fungal canker starts. And you literally get thousands or tens of thousands of these little beetles going into a walnut tree and introducing new cankers. And it's literally death by a thousand cankers. So the process is that the, the cankers form around where the beetle has, has bored into the tree, um, around the galleries, um, 
and then you get hundreds of these or thousands of cankers, and they they grow and they coalesce and um, finally kill the, the the tree's ability to move water and nutrients through its system. And as the uh, as the tree starts to decline, um, declining trees will send out chemical scents um, that are attractive to things like the walnut twig beetle, and so even more and more beetles are attracted to the tree, and it's this kind of downward death spiral of the, of the tree as thousands of beetles build up their population, and as a result, you get lots of, lots of cankers, and then eventually the tree is killed. So you can see uh, some, some little walnut twig beetles here, and to give you an idea of the size of the walnut twig beetle, if you have a dime and you look at the eye and liberty on that dime, that's about the size of the walnut twig beetle. Um, so here are some walnut twig beetles that are, that are boring into this tree, and the, the white on their surface are the fungal spores. And you can see in the, this little pupil chamber here how the, the spores are, are building up. And so it's, it's not a systemic infection, it's um, lots, of, uh, lots of individual infections that kill the tree. With Dutch elm disease, it's a, maybe a single introduction of the pathogen, and then that pathogen moves throughout the tree, but in this case, it's lots of tiny little cankers that form and, and kill the tree. And to give you the, an idea of the reproductive potential of the walnut twig beetle, these are a couple of short little sections of logs that researchers at Colorado State uh, University cut up and then reared the beetles out of it. And then some poor graduate student had to count all the beetles that, that came out of those logs, and they counted over 23,000 beetles in those two logs, and that calculated out to about 35 beetles per square inch. So this thing's really got a high reproductive potential, and that's why you know, a tiny little beetle can kill a huge, magnificent black walnut tree. So the distribution up until last year was just known in eight western states. Um, but then in July of, of uh, 2010, uh, it was discovered in Knoxville, Tennessee, which is right in the middle of the native range of black walnut, which was really disturbing. Um, Previously, it had just been out in the western states where black walnut is not native, but black walnuts are planted as, as street trees and landscape trees. So the question is, where did it come from? And it's believed that this is a, a native pest, a native beetle and a native fungus. Um, and it was originally associated with Arizona walnut, which is down in the, the southwestern U.S. and uh, Mexico. Um, and on Arizona walnut, it's really not much of a pest. Um, it's just the beetle acts like a typical twig beetle, and it, it kills some of the twigs at the tip of the tree, but doesn't cause mortality in the trees. And this is the native range of Arizona walnut, which is also believed to be the general native distribution of the walnut twig beetle and, and the geosmithia fungus. But at some point, and it's believed it was more of a short-term uh, distribution rather than a uh, a long over time movement northward, but more of a, a shorter, maybe a, a climate event that, that allowed the beetles and the, and the fungus to move northward uh, into some of the western states where black walnut is planted as a, as a street tree. Um, so again, I, you know, as I noted, it's, it's, um, it's not a pest on, on the Arizona walnut necessarily, but on, on black walnut it's, it's completely lethal. Um, and so when it was introduced into those uh, western states, um, it was found to, um, to be, uh, to have a high potential of mortality on, on black walnut. Um, so at some point, uh, the, the beetle and the fungus jumped hosts from the Arizona walnut uh, to black walnut. And somewhere back around 2000, 2001, um, it was noticed that, that black walnut trees in, in Colorado were, were starting to die. And, and I think initially people were associating that with uh, drought stress at the time. Um, but then the first published association of the actual walnut twig beetle with mortality was in 2002 in, in New Mexico. Um, and like I said, it was originally associated with, with uh, drought stress until they actually found the walnut twig beetle. Uh, the symptoms to look for if you have black walnut trees in your yard or, or very few nurseries produce black walnut, I think, but um, in older neighborhoods especially, you're going to find a lot of black walnut that was either planted intentionally or, or things like squirrels will, will plant those, uh, 
those seeds and they end up in, in people's fence rows at the, at the edge of their properties. So if you look in older neighborhoods around Kansas City, you're probably gonna find a lot of black walnut. Um, but as far as symptoms, um, the first thing that you're gonna notice probably is a little yellow flagging out at the tips of, uh, of the branches up in the canopy. Um, but then over time, um, the symptoms are going to progress from the top of the tree downward. Um, the beetle seems to tend to like uh, the upper canopy of the tree when it first infests the tree, but over time, year after year, as the population grows, uh, the beetles will move downward on the tree. Um, and so you'll start to see some wilting foliage. The brown wilting leaves are, are going to hang onto the tree. Um, you're going to see more yellowing foliage, and then often, uh, uh, the brown leaves and the, and the wilting foliage and the thinning of the canopy are going to move downward in the, in the tree canopy. And then, you know, over time you're going to see larger sections of dead wood, um, wilting and yellowing uh, throughout the crown, and the remaining crown is going to be a lot thinner. Now, the, the thing about this disease is, and what makes it very hard to detect, is that after its first introduction into the tree, it's going to be maybe six to eight years before you see any of those symptoms at all, even the, the little yellow flagging tips in the canopy. So that makes detection really difficult, or early detection very difficult. But once you start seeing those initial symptoms, uh, mortality of the tree is going to happen really quickly. It might be as quick as one to two years, maybe two to three years from those initial outward symptoms until the tree is, is totally dead. So some more signs that you might look for. Um, it says tiny exit holes, and, and I mean, tiny is an understatement, I think. If you think about that eye and liberty on a dime and how tiny that is, um, the exit holes are very tiny. So if you look at the bark of a, of a black walnut tree, it's very rough and coarse, and so finding those exit holes is going to be very difficult. But also, if you, if you peel under the dead bark, you're going to see these transverse galleries um, under the bark. Um, so again, just to to look at where the, the beetles are known to be, um, or the, the, the disease. It's in those eight western states, but then again, um, back in July of 2010, it was discovered in, in Knoxville, Tennessee. And the green area there is the native distribution of black walnut. And Knoxville, Tennessee is, is right in the middle of that. Um, so when it was first discovered um, out in the western states, I think there was a lot of hope that, you know, maybe that uh, the Great Plains region would act kind of as a, as a buffer to keep it out of the native range of black walnut, but that wasn't the case. Um, we seem to be uh, very efficient with human-assisted transport of forest pests like this, so moving of firewood, of, um, of, of uh, logs and, and lumber, and, and then there's, uh, with walnut especially, it's a very popular species for hobbyist uh, woodworkers. And so there's folks on eBay that will trade um, walnut wood over the internet. Um, so as, as far as a, a regulatory response, uh, there's eight states now that have state quarantines uh, to keep, hopefully keep uh, thousand cankers disease out of their states. Uh, Missouri enacted ours back in uh, April of 2010 and then uh, very quickly after that several other states uh, enacted quarantines including Kansas. Um, so basically the intent of the quarantine is to uh, keep certain wood products from moving into non-infested states. Um, and that's going to include uh, logs, um, you know, rough cut lumber with bark that hasn't been treated yet, nursery stock. And there is a little bit of uh, black walnut nursery stock movement. Um, and then also just uh, firewood in general, um, all hardwood firewood from uh, from nine western states as well as Tennessee is, is prohibited under uh, most of these state quarantines. And then also Tennessee, when they discovered uh, thousand cankers disease, they enacted a, a state interior quarantine over the, um, the several counties that are known to be infested. Um, and those counties in Tennessee are, are those four, uh, Anderson, Blount, Knox, and Union. And then they also quarantine the surrounding counties around there as a, as a buffer. So just to kind of give you a visual perspective of where a thousand cankers disease is in Tennessee, the, the blue counties there are the known infested counties, and then the yellow counties are the, the buffer counties around that. But the, the delimiting survey to determine where this is at um, is, is only about five or six months in. Um, and so they've got a, a backlog of samples that they're working through and, and um, still have folks out looking. Um, in urban landscapes and in the forests uh, 
for signs of the disease. So this is just a very early picture of where 1,000 cankers disease might be distributed in, in Tennessee. Um, so like I said, it was discovered in July of 2010 in Tennessee, and there was a, an observant homeowner um, in Knoxville that uh, had a very large black walnut tree, and he noticed that the, the canopy was starting to die out of it, and at that time there was starting to be a lot of talk about 1,000 cankers disease, so he called his uh, state forestry department, and someone came out and looked at it and identified uh, uh, the beetle and the fungus in the tree, and then um, since then it was found uh, pretty widely spread throughout the Knoxville region. Um, and we had some folks that went out there uh, last fall and, and was able to look around and the disease is, seems to be really well established out there. I, estimates are that it's probably been there anywhere from 10 to 20 years in the Knoxville area. Um, so, you know, if you go back and look at that map of where we know it's distributed right now, that's, um, that's probably not even close to the the actual distribution of, of the disease. Um, it's a very good chance that it's in Missouri or Kansas or Nebraska or, or several other states in between. Um, but uh, the difficulty with it is, is that, um, as I said, it takes several years for the symptoms to express and um, there's not a good trap for it right now. Um, so we're relying on visual surveys, which is very imperfect, uh, not just with thousand cankers disease, but a lot of the other forest pests that we look for. Uh, it's always best if you've got a, a very nice, uh, specific trap that is very attractive to the pest you're trying to survey for. So there are some researchers at the uh, U.S. Forest Service and University of California at Davis that are working on a pheromone right now, and we hope that'll uh, be available maybe in the next couple of years so we can do some really intensive uh, survey uh, throughout Missouri and, and these other uh, large black walnut producing states. Uh, and there's a look at some trees there in Knoxville that. Uh, are infected with thousand cankers disease and this is in a pretty advanced stage of, of infection right there and that was pretty typical to find around the Knoxville area. So why does Missouri care about thousand cankers disease? Um, we're the largest black walnut producing state. Um, the Missouri Department of Conservation which is our forestry uh, department um, estimated that it would have about an 851 million dollar economic impact on our state and that would be uh, the forest products industry, the nursery industry, um, landowners, um, urban landscapes, uh, city, forester, uh, city forestry budgets that would uh, have to go in and remove dead and dying black walnut trees. Um, and obviously we have a forest products industry in the state that's uh, very reliant on black walnut as a, as a valuable species. Uh, and that industry total is worth about five billion dollars uh, in Missouri. Um, we only have a few nurseries in the state um, that, uh, that produce and ship black walnut, um, but those nurseries produce a lot of it, and it would have a, a tremendous impact, if nothing else, just because of quarantines alone, and then the market demand that would probably uh, happen if it were found in, in the vicinity of their nurseries. Uh, we also have one of the, wor the world's largest black walnut nut meat producer uh, located in Stockton, Missouri. So if you go to the grocery store and you pick up a bag of black walnut, it's, it's probably going to say Hammond's products on that. And they're located in, in southwest Missouri. Um, and it's also a very important mast species for our wildlife in the state. So it's, it's got a lot of value all the way around. Um, if you look at something like emerald ash borer, um, it's, a, it's a forest products pest, and it's certainly a pest to uh, cities that have a lot of uh, landscape ash trees. Uh, but thousand cankers is a little different, that it, it affects a lot of different segments of our agriculture industry, our forestry industry, and, and our urban landscapes. Uh, so we did do a little bit of uh, preliminary survey uh, in Missouri in 2010. Um, a lot of it was based on homeowner calls or landowner calls, um, but we also uh, did do a lot of looking around at, um, at uh, uh, black walnut um, plantations um, and around urban landscapes. And um, uh, we took samples and we ran those through our, our State Department of Ag Lab and the, uh, the diagnostic clinic at the Missouri Department of Conservation as well. Um, and obviously so far we haven't found it in Missouri. Uh, so 2011 efforts, um, both in Missouri and, and nationwide, um, a lot of agencies in Missouri are going to be surveying for thousand cankers disease, uh, and we've also uh, been talking with our neighboring states so we can kind of have a coordinated uh, uniform effort in that survey. Um, 
starting to gear up and do a lot of outreach um, with various uh, segments of, of the industries. And if you go to our booth out here, we've got a, a diagnost diagnostic brochure for thousand cankers disease that was just produced by our uh, conservation department. And it's really geared towards uh, homeowners, um, helps them determine whether they've even got a black walnut tree and then uh, what to look for for signs of, of thousand cankers. Um, and so some of your customers might be, might be interested in those brochures, so feel free to take a lot of those with you. Um, regulatory enforcement um, and education is going to be a big effort in 2011. Uh, we've actually been working with the Missouri Highway Patrol um, to look at, uh, with their uh, commercial vehicle unit, to look at um, log shipments that are coming in uh, from other states and, and to find out if uh, they're from a quarantine state and if it's black walnut. And we have a system in place where they'll contact the Department of Ag if, if they find a shipment um, so we can go out and take a look at the logs or whatever the wood product might be. Um, a lot of research starting to gear up right now. Um, University of Missouri uh, has one of the largest black walnut uh, germplasm repositories in the nation. Um, and so they're going to be testing um, those different varieties for resistance to thousand cankers disease. And they've already been working with researchers at uh, Colorado State University and, and they're beginning to work with uh, researchers at uh, University of Tennessee to, to uh, test those different varieties against uh, thousand cankers disease looking for resistance. That's going to be more of a, a very long-term solution uh, to TCD, but it's something that really needs to get started right now. Um, I mentioned the, the pheromone research. Uh, we hope that that comes about really soon so we can start doing a more wide-scale uh, survey. And then also there's a lot of research that's gearing up for uh, effective treatments uh, so wood products can continue to move in commerce uh, without the risk of moving uh, thousand cankers disease with it. Uh, also right now the U.S. Forest Service is leading uh, the development of a national response framework and it's kind of a a national action plan uh, for thousand cankers disease and it's kind of outlines the roles and responsibilities of different agencies around the country and, and their part in, in controlling this. Um, and we're also looking for a lot of uh, multi-state cooperation. Uh, we've been working with our counterparts in Kansas and Nebraska and Iowa and Illinois and in Arkansas and a lot of other states on kind of having a, a unified coordinated response to thousand cankers disease. Um, so there's our website uh, for the Missouri Department of Ag for Thousand Cankers Disease. Uh, there's a lot of information there, um, a lot of uh, outreach documents. And then also back in the fall of 2009, we hosted uh, with the Conservation Department a, uh, a national conference on Thousand Cankers Disease. So um, on the website are all the PowerPoint presentations uh, that were presented there, and, and these were anyone in the United States that had any kind of knowledge of thousand cankers disease or had done any kind of preliminary research. Um, so all of that information is there if you're interested in that. And just real quickly, I um, wanted to do an update on um, what we're doing with emerald ash borer. I'm sure a lot of you here have been hearing about emerald ash borer over the last several years, so I won't go into details on that, but if you did want more detailed information on the pest or its biology or anything like that, um, come and talk to us at our booth afterwards, but um, with a, a survey grant from USDA, we've been doing a, a statewide survey uh, throughout the state over the last few years, and it's using uh, these big purple sticky traps, and I don't know if you all have seen those, but uh, it's rather large and rather sticky and, and not very fun to handle, but uh, we've got some summer survey technicians that go out and set these traps all over the state. And so last year we put out uh, over 400 of these purple sticky traps and we placed them at, at high risk areas that are associated with firewood um, and other pathways. And so mostly these are placed at campgrounds around the state and, and at our, our state parks and, uh, and federal campgrounds, they have really good uh, reservation system information. So we can tell, you know, maybe back over the last five or 10 years uh, where their campers uh, have come from. And so we, we target campgrounds that have had a lot of traffic from Michigan and Indiana and Ohio, uh, states where emerald ash borer has been established for quite a while. Uh, so we put out over 400 traps around the state and, um, and there are no new finds in Missouri other than that Wayne County location down there in, in southeast Missouri where we discovered emerald ash borer back in 2008. Um, and USDA Plant Protection and Quarantine has been doing a, a rather large delimit survey around that site in southeast Missouri. And so right in the center of that grid uh, is the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers campground where it was initially discovered. And um, last year, 
Um, they detected emerald ash borer about four and a half miles north of that campground and then a few miles to the south. Um, so as we do more delimit work down there, we're finding uh, how widespread the, the population there actually is. Um, so why do we go to the trouble of doing all this delimit work uh, down in that area when we know emerald ash borer is there and established? Um, when it was first discovered up in Michigan, you know, people thought, well, we can eradicate this. And so millions of dollars were poured into eradication in southeast Michigan and then quickly discovered that, well, this thing is spread throughout several states and it's a lot larger than we thought. Well, the, the, the mindset now is just trying to, in those new population areas that are just discovered, trying to slow the spread of that, that pest uh, out of that area. And so down at the, the Corps of Engineers campground, um, we're working on a, a pilot project with the U.S. Forest Service called SLAM, or Slow Ash Mortality. Now, when er initial eradication efforts were going on um, in Michigan and some of these other states, the fear was is that if you went in and just clear-cut ash trees out of those infested areas, that the beetles are actually going to be pushed out farther looking for new host material. And so, since our population in southeast Missouri is, is somewhat isolated, um, the, the concept here is, uh, for SLAM, is to first identify the boundaries of the population and then remove a lot of ash trees within that boundary, but leave clusters of ash trees just back within the perimeter of the population um, as kind of an attractant. So the beetles are drawn back into these clusters of trees that uh, usually are girdled and stressed to be much more attractive to the beetle. Um, and then, um, the, the following year go in and either destroy those trees or treat them with insecticides and make them lethal um, as kind of a, a trap uh, back within the boundary of the, of the population. Um, but over the last two to three years, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers has, has removed ash trees that are greater than four inches in diameter over several hundred acres in that area. Um, and then through this Forest Service project that we've been doing, um, we do have a lot of those clusters of, of uh, uh, lethal trees or trap trees back within the boundary and we continue to do a lot of uh, delimiting work both with uh, plant protection and quarantine and also with the U.S. Forest Service. And outreach has been a, a really big component of our emerald ash borer program in Missouri. And so uh, uh, a year ago we received a grant from USDA to uh, to do a lot of outreach efforts. Since we're one of those states that's kind of out on the, on the edge of the national EAB population, um, it seems really critical for us to get that message out to stop movement from the infested areas out to places like Kansas or Nebraska or other states that don't yet have emerald ash borer. Um, and so we placed 15 of these billboards around the state, and of course the, the firewood message was a big part of that, trying to draw people to our uh, cooperative website that University of Missouri has put up um, to give them more information about emerald ash borer and ways that it's moved and, and things that they can do to prevent the spread of it. Um, and on that website, if you wanted to go there, we've got a lot of our outreach materials, um, our regulatory information. We've got an online reporting system that folks can go to and, and report if they think they've seen emerald ash borer. Uh, there are some management tips that are posted there. Um, we have a lot of our outreach material, our, our radio ads and, and uh, things like that. Um, this year we're, we're really gearing up and doing a lot of uh, radio ads with Learfield uh, Communications throughout the state, uh, educating folks on, on how emerald ash borer has moved and how they can prevent that. And, and uh, we're partnering with um, the St. Louis Cardinals and the Springfield Cardinals uh, to do some outreach events at those ballparks and uh, doing a lot of, a lot of other activities like that. So just to give you kind of the overall picture of where emerald ash borer is in the United States now, I believe it's in 15 states total now. Um, uh, the, the same week that Knoxville, uh, Tennessee discovered thousand cankers disease, they also discovered emerald ash borer there. Um, so the folks in Knoxville um, kind of got a, a double whammy all at once. Uh, but you can see that it's, it's up in the St. Paul, Michigan area. Uh, Northeast Iowa just discovered it uh, a couple of years ago. Um, and then, of course, in the, the Michigan, Indiana, Ohio area there, it's, it's well established. I uh, just wanted to talk about gypsy moth real quick. I think I've got a few minutes left here. Um, gypsy moth, um, up until we, we discovered thousand cankers disease, uh, seemed to be probably the biggest invasive pest threat uh, to Missouri. And this is the reason why. We've got about 
16 million acres of forest land in Missouri, and about 12 million of those acres are uh, predominantly oak. And oak is the preferred host of the gypsy moth. Um, and our forest products industry relies very heavily on, on oak uh, for its business. Um, our tourism industry is, is focused very heavily around the Ozark forests and camping and, and outdoor tourism. Um, so our Ozark forests, we're very, very proud of them in Missouri and we're very protective of them. And um, the gypsy moth presents a, a very huge threat to that resource. So um, since 1967, we've been surveying the state for gypsy moth. Um, several agencies, uh, USDA, uh, the Forest Service, uh, Missouri Department of Ag, Missouri Department of Conservation. Uh, we also have help from uh, US Army, uh, from the Missouri National Guard, uh, US Fish and Wildlife. Um, and um, we, we usually put on a, a pretty big survey. Um, gypsy moth was introduced into the United States back in the late 1800s, um, accidentally. Um, and since that time, it's spread from the Boston area where it was first introduced, and it keeps moving uh, westward every year. And so it's getting really close to Missouri now. And um, just last year, um, Iowa had a, a huge explosion of gypsy moth up in northeast Iowa. And so this following year, um, they're going to be treating somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, 170,000 acres um, in northeast Iowa for the gypsy moth, and that's really getting close to Missouri and our Ozark forests. Um, so for our survey, we, we, divide, um, we divide the survey up. Um, each agency is responsible for a, a certain number of counties. Um, and our 2009 results, we had one of our biggest years in the last probably 20 years. Uh, we captured 22 moths around the state, and usually the captures are are associated with high tourism areas. Uh, the gypsy moth will lay its egg mass on just about anything. Um, so if you've got a place um, where RVs are coming in from the northeastern states or maybe uh, uh, rail cars or semi-trucks or places like that where the egg masses come in on those, on those vehicles and then they hatch out uh, when they get here, that's usually where, where it's associated with. So we typically find gypsy moth in the Kansas City area, St. Louis area, and then down in the Branson area in southwest Missouri, where there's a lot of tourism. So 22 moths in 2009, and then in 2010, we only captured two moths. Um, and it seems like the population, or the, the numbers that we capture in Missouri fluctuate from year to year, depending on what's going on out in the eastern states. Um, but we also, um, every once in a while, we have um, we have a concern that maybe the pheromone wasn't working. I think it was back in 2005, we got a bad batch of pheromone. Uh, we had very low captures like this and we were kind of worried about that. Uh, so we worked with the manufacturer on, on determining whether the pheromone was good or not. And so when we only captured two moths this year, we thought, well, maybe that's a possibility again. So we worked uh, with USDA and, and the manufacturer of the pheromone to, to test uh, the lots of pheromone that we had received and, and it appears that the, the pheromone was sufficient enough that it should have worked properly. Uh, so historically, uh, since that 1967 survey, you can kind of see what we've captured in Missouri. Um, and there in the mid-90s, um, gypsy moth had, had become established in northern Arkansas, and so we were getting a lot of spillover into southern Missouri, and that's, so why, that's why the numbers were so high that year. Um, but usually we catch somewhere between 10 and 20 moths per year. It's never been established in Missouri, never had a reproducing population that we know of uh, that's become established in Missouri. But the, the whole reason for our, our, our survey efforts is early detection, because unlike thousand cankers disease or emerald ash borer, where eradication really is not um, an option at this point, uh, with gypsy moth it is. Uh, there is a very good trapping system available, so early detection is, is possible. And then there's also a lot of good uh, chemicals and, and pheromone uh, disruption products that we can use uh, to actually eradicate a population if it were to become established in Missouri. Uh, so this is one that um, putting a lot of resources into it is, is worth it. And then just visually, you can see historically since uh, 1980 where we've captured uh, gypsy moth in, in the state of Missouri. And again, you know, you can see the cluster over St. Louis, Kansas City, and then southwest Missouri. And so with that, um, if there's time for questions, be glad to, to take any. And this is um, actually a, a scene from Wayne County, Missouri, and those are some, uh, some poor ash trees that have um, fallen uh, to U.S. Corps of Engineers chainsaws and, and uh, 
That's our control program in Wayne County. Any questions? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, with, with emerald ash borer and thousand cankers disease, at least with the beetle, um, those are wood borers that go inside the tree. Uh, with gypsy moth, it's actually the, the caterpillar uh, or the larval stage uh, that defoliates the tree. So with the other two, they're boring into the wood, uh, but with gypsy moth, they're actually defoliating the tree, eating the leaves. And so if you get year after year where the, the trees are defoliated and, and not able to you know, produce and grow, um, it, it stresses the tree and, and eventually kills it uh, over time. It's not a, once the tree's infected, it's, it could be a, an annual thing. It's just the long-term decline. Long-term decline. And, and in the Missouri Ozarks, um, our oak trees have, have been under stress there for, for quite some time. And so you add something that really has a lot of destructive potential like gypsy moth into that mix, um, it'll happen a lot faster. That's a good point. Um, and one thing that we've started to do since we've been able to get this uh, outreach grant for Emerald Ash Bore is start working with, uh, with more youth organizations. And, and um, uh, we're working through um, the schools, uh, through the Missouri Department of Conservation, um, to develop some curriculum for those groups. But yeah, there's, there are youth organizations for sure, like 4 H and Boy Scouts. That, yeah. That's a good point. So take that back and I will. <laughs> We've got a very uh, enthusiastic outreach coordinator that uh, is, is trying to identify those types of target audiences uh, to reach out to. And yeah, I, I, you're right. I know, I know those folks, they, they go on campouts and a lot of times they'll bring their own firewood with them. And most of the time. Most of the time. Yep. Can I think also back to that, and that's actually a cool question. I just had a quick question. About the thousand cankers disease, since it takes so long to be noticeable, once you've noticed it in a population, is there no really feasible way to eradicate it? You can just basically quarantine and try to stop the spread. But yeah, that, and that's why we're so anxious about getting that pheromone, so we can actually do early detection ahead of the, the symptoms. You know, we don't, we don't want to find it after it's been in a tree for six or eight years. We want to find it as soon as those beetles are there. So that's why this pheromone shows a lot of promise, um, but it's going to be a couple of years before we, we have that available. And so at this point, we're totally reliant just on, on visual surveys, on taking samples, taking them back to our, our lab in a secure condition and, and um, identifying either the fungus or the beetle. Um, so yeah, early detection is always our goal, but I mean it makes it very difficult with things like thousand cankers and emerald ash borer where, you know, they might be in a tree for several years before you can visually see it. And by that time it's, it's too late or, um, you know, the point that you made is that, you know, a, a dying tree or a dead tree makes really good firewood and so people, you know, want to make use of that and they cut it up in the firewood and then they take it with them camping several states away or, or to some other part of the state and, and reintroduce that pest. So, so there's, there's really no way to eradicate that once it's actually in a population. Yeah, and, and so nationally, you know, our picture is that we want to identify where it's at 
and try to keep it from moving out of those areas. Yep. Yeah, uh, there's a researcher at Colorado State University, Whitney Cranshaw, who's a, an entomologist out there who's been working on some systemics that um, would be geared more towards the homeowner who wants to save a very, very valuable tree in their yard. Um, it wouldn't be necessarily for large walnut plantations that are, that are producing you know, veneer quality logs or forested areas. Um, that type of research would be geared towards more of the homeowner trying to protect an ind individual tree or, or two. So yeah, they're looking at some uh, some systemics like uh, imidacloprid is a is a very common uh, systemic insecticide used for other wood borers. So that's one of the compounds that's being tested. Thank you. Yep. Thank you.